Welcome to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Your go-to hub for all things writing, world building, and the occasional dive into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We're breaking down the barriers between you and your next great story. Whether you're a seasoned scribe or just scribbling your first sentences, We've got something for you. We'll be discussing everything from crafting compelling characters to dissecting the good, the bad, and the downright bizarre in the world of fiction. Okay, this script says you guys are eccentric. Isn't that just a three-syllable word for weird? No offense. So, whether you're in need of inspiration, a good laugh, or just a couple of weirdos to keep you company on your writing journey... You're in the right place. Thanks for tuning in to the Wordy Pair Podcast. All right. Welcome to the Wordy Pair Podcast. And we are deliberately not saying the episode number because we're going out of order because current events. I'm Rudy. And I'm Justin, and and we don't have we don't have to do that. I said we don't, we have, don't to do have to that. do that. I know, but I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to tell everybody that we're that we're we're going. We're, we're, you know what? You're uh... the one that puts them all out there. I'm going to leave it in your hands. <laughs> that's fine. We'll, I'll, we'll figure it out. Anyway, today we are going to be talking about something that's actually a little timely, and I'm going to try to actually put this episode up at the top of the queue instead of at the bottom. Because uh, um, before you do that, okay. Before you do that, since since we're since we're not going to uh, keep things in order for this one anyway, yeah, it is January twenty seventh. It's it's almost the end of January twenty seventh, yeah, twenty twenty four, and today was the day that we released our ninth episode, which was the joy of Pippi Longstocking. Yes, a very good episode. Which of course prompted me to decide that today was Pippi Day. And so I've been all over Twitter putting up posts about Pippi Longstocking. And by all over, I mean in my little unseen section of Twitter. <laughs> I've, been but, send, I've, been creating, I've been creating posts that only I can see. <laughs> yes, for my own devilish amusement. <laughs> and posts that are available to the public, but that only I will see. <laughs> and if you try to see them, I will gouge your eyes out. <laughs> gouge those eyes. But yes, it's, I, it is important for everyone to be aware that January 27th was Pippi Day, because I, I mean, said so. There's probably already a Pippi Day. Maybe in Sweden. I doubt anywhere else. Well, I mean, it's probably an international holiday. You know how the UN gets. Do you really think the UN has enough class to, like, Pippi Longstocking? No. But do you think that there's enough pressure to make them do it grudgingly? No. It, Pippi Longstocking hasn't been famous in over 20 years. I am amazed that it got a cartoon in 1997. Stuff is but like, it was in Canada, literature. and nobody ever sees anything that happens from Canada, so it doesn't matter. It, is, it was in America's hat, and no one ever looks inside hats. Yeah. Except for detectives. They go on the stand, and we don't think about them until we need our hat again. And since it's the year 2024, and nobody wears hats, well, Canada just kind of sits there and, I don't know, Gathers dust. swells. <laughs> All right. Now that we've been canceled by Canada, let's uh, <laughs> let's introduce. We got that one in early. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll introduce today's topic because what we're going to be talking about is localizing or translating works, and we have a. I think that we have a pretty good pr- perspective on this because number one, we are writers. Number two, we both watch a lot of anime and Japanese stuff in general. Number three, we both know a decent amount of Japanese. And number and, four, uh, and do translations and stuff. And number four, uh, number four, we are old, and yes. we were there when this all went down. Do In not the recite the deep magic to me, which I was there when it was written, and it was written w- in glorious fan subs. I was re- I was in the trenches when they called it Japanimation. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I was there when people thought the show on television on Sci Fi was called Saturday a Nime. <laughs> Did anyone ever really, ever really say that to you? Holy cow. No, nobody ever said that to me, actually, but I was 14 years old, and that's what I thought it was. So. <laughs> <laughs> and the very Excellent. next year, I started learning Japanese. That's how that went down. So, so. <laughs> Eight Man After? What a strange name for a movie. <laughs> yeah, so it turns out I just couldn't read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so, so, yeah, so we have a pretty, like, we have a pretty 
multi-directional perspective on this. Both of us do. So I figured we would kind of talk about this because because we don't want to get into like like yelling at particular people and like that. But but we can probably get into a good like overview of what authors need to worry about, what localizers should and shouldn't do, stuff like that. So and probably we'll have a little, couple of little arguments or disagreements about exactly where these lines should be drawn. So uh, let's get started, I guess. Well, probably not too many. I mean, so so I mean, obviously, this is a weird no, topic to, or it might seem like a weird topic to bring up on a writing podcast. Well, well but no, consider... because because if you're a writer, no, no, this this is totally apt for a writing podcast. Because if you're a writer and you're successful, your stuff is gonna be translated someday into a different language, right? And so it's important to, you know, keep an eye on what those translations are doing because that's 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 kind of how we got into the into the mess we're in today. Is that the the com- you know the companies have authors and then the companies get the books and then the companies basically shell out the uh, translation to the lowest bidder, and those lowest bidders uh, take liber- liberties with what with the material in ways that the author would never permit or, or, or like, you know? And, and we've seen this happen already. We've seen authors and, you know, creators in Japan looking at what's being produced, uh, you know, from their works here and saying, don't, don't do that. Stop it. And so, you know, if you're a successful writer, you need to keep an eye on your, the translations of your works. And you shouldn't just, you know, fire and forget because otherwise you end up in the situation where we are now, where, People's good works are being turned into less good works by inept or vile people who want to insert weird messages into everything. I would like to raise the point that you use writer and successful in the same sentence. Just, just. Uh... I'm not saying that I'm a successful writer. <laughs> I'm saying that I'm saying that if I ever become successful, I will because of this situation. I will understand that I need to keep an eye on the translations of my works, if it ever happens. I almost said, God forbid. Listen, listen, we're talking <laughs> about writers. We're not talking about successful people. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm done. <laughs> no, actually, I just as an aside, I, I occasionally see people, people asking the question, what's the difference between an author and a writer? And I usually tell people, well, a writer makes money. <laughs> and and sometimes people will argue with me, but like you can be an author who makes money writing, but you never describe yourself. Uh, you, you never say like, "What do you do for a living?" Well, I author. No, you you say I'm a writer. So it's the writers that make money. Authors just have books in print, <laughs> or you know, books that are published in some way. Sure. So so some people say it backwards. They say anyone can be a writer, but not everyone can be an author. Not true. It's really easy to be an author. Not everyone can be a writer. <laughs> well, it depends on where you... I mean, yeah, I mean, it depends on whether you say professional writer or not, because anybody can be a... Anyone can be a writer. Um, it's true to some extent, but I mean, like, that's that's like saying anyone can be a plumber, which, you know, might be true, but some people might... Well, well no, have, there's, there's, there's specific skills and tools to being a plumber that you would need to have... And that's true of writing, but the skill of actually writing a thing down, n- not making it good or not making it sellable or not making it fun to read, but the act of writing a thing down is, you know, fortunately we live in a country where literacy rates are, you know, above 90%, probably that's, significantly higher than that. That's because despite all of our, well, I, I don't think we've, I don't know if we really have mentioned that in any of our writing stuff, but we've done a lot of what, recordings. Li- literacy rates? No, not literacy rates. More like education. Oh, sure. Well, this is this isn't that kind of podcast. Yeah, yeah. So we're we're we are talking about groups of people that want to put their books in languages that they themselves might not necessarily speak, or even if they do, they're they're going to have someone translating, helping them with the translation, because like. Well, so so this is an interesting perspective too, because we're we're not published by any particularly large publisher, and large publishers probably put a wall somewhat between the author and the the translators. Almost but certainly. In, in the indie sense, you can you can actually um, there's all kinds of cool things that you could do to to make sure that your works are being translated faithfully. For instance, you can you could probably just hire someone who's bilingual to go through the book 
as like a you know a, a, to go through the translated version of the book as a beta reader and say and and give them you know the the original language of the book and say are is some you know is the translator taking liberties with my writing or not and you know they can explain to you oh yeah the you know here they're adding these words and these words and these words and they can point at them in the book and you can look them up on Google Translate and say, oh, yeah, I didn't say anything like this. Why is this in my translation? Yes, you... and, and realistically, people should be taking – the authors should be taking this this time if they care at all about their works being, you know, observed as the stuff that they made and not something that somebody else made on top of – because, like, when someone takes your, your – you know, something that you wrote and, and put a lot of time and effort into and then they start throwing their own garbage on top of it, it's like – it's not even fan fiction. It's like bad fan fiction. It's like really bad fan fiction. And like, you know, you don't want your stuff, you don't want your stuff getting buried under a bunch of garbage. It ruins your reputation too. Yeah. And you don't want someone and you don't want someone responsible for a translation of your work who is going to, who is going to take it upon themselves to say, well, this is how I interpreted the character in my head. Yeah. Especially like, like if you've sold books if you've made money off of books, it's because of what you wrote and what you created. Yeah. And anyone who's doing that, anyone who is taking those liberties, is trying to ride your coattails for a paycheck that is unwarranted because nobody gives a crap about what they think about your character. They want to read your story, not theirs. Yeah, and and, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to get a platform for their things that nobody else cares about. By using yeah, you know, the writing on coattails is a good is a good ex- is a good explanation of it. Absolutely. Yeah, because they they don't want to put the work in to come up with something themselves and try to market it to people. They just want to they they just want to be able to you, you know they they want to say something off the shoulders of giants. They want to be able to stand there and 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 that's not even a proper that's not even the best way to put it because it's more pathetic no, because, than that. Like standing, standing on, on the, the shoulders of giants is something everyone does. Yeah, right? yeah. Standing on the shoulders of giants just means that we're making progress. What, what Someone doing, comes up with an idea. Is they're taking is they're taking your voice and saying their things in your voice. Yeah, they they're uh, they are doing you a disservice, and at the same time, they're you know they're collecting a paycheck for doing yeah. it. And on top of that, they could be hurting your reputation. Exactly. Now, this is a thing that we bring up as fans of anime for a couple of very specific reasons uh sure. not even not even talking about the currently relevant reasons uh y- you go back to the start of of Japan's anime invasion into America sure and there was this period where almost everything that you were watching you had to uh you had you had to find someone to send you VHS tapes from overseas to get your hands on it this was at the start of an age where you couldn't watch things online or on computers because computers weren't powerful enough for you to sit through full episodes of cartoons and well, I mean, have good you, quality. You could, but they would be very poor quality, and you couldn't store very many of them on your hard drive, right? Because they would take up a lot of space, too. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was kind of around the time where anime first started getting a voice a, a bigger voice in America that we were still we, we still weren't even using like gigabyte hard drives right like i remember having a 456 meg hard drive in my computer and this was at a time when like the one piece comic was starting like back in 1998 or something well, i mean and i mean I, I i had i think i had a i think i had a 6 gig hard drive in 98 or 99 and that was really huge at the time because yeah. you could put everything you wanted on there and now but, six I mean, gigs is like a, a a coughing attack on the side of the road. Yeah. Uh, well, six gigs is less than the size of most movies that you would download on from like a a download service these days. Yeah. What with the uh, all the upgrades and higher resolutions, big old four and eight K files. Well, yeah, four yeah. and eight K resolutions, not files. <laughs> if they were four and eight K files, they wouldn't <laughs> look very good at all. <laughs> But, but uh, the yeah, so 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 you you would you would be, I mean the, so you're talking about stuff even before I actually started no even really knew what anime was like the only the first the for the first like significant well that's not exactly true, I don't know. Probably I usually I don't about... include the period where I was watching anime but didn't know what it was. Like Grimm's well, Fairy yes, Tale Adventures was something that I watched as a kid in the eighties, and when I, was, I didn't... when I was really little, I watched The Little Prince, which yeah. turns out to be an anime. And Speed Racer, I didn't know it was Speed from Japan. Speed Racer, yeah, I didn't know that either. 
There was a few shows like that where I didn't know what they were. I didn't know that they had originally come from Japan. But, like, probably I started getting into anime and manga and knowing what it was around the time I was eight. So that'd be around 1990, 1991, something like that. And uh, that was about when, that was, a for me, that, that, was, that was the time that I started getting into it and, and knowing what it was. Yeah, and, I mean, that was the period when we, yeah, like, we didn't even have Windows 95 yet. The internet wasn't nope. really a thing at that point. Nope, pretty much. And I didn't have a computer. I mean, I, I, I had video game consoles like a Nintendo and a, maybe, maybe, I don't think I even had a Super Nintendo at that point. But I mean, I remember, I remember finding the, anim- there, there, there was an anime section at Hollywood Video back in the day. And I found stuff there. Sci-Fi Channel had started their Saturday anime thing. There were occasional, like there was that U.S. manga core, or U.S. manga core, that they had that very recognizable mecha that they plagiarized from somewhere, I think. <laughs> and Almost certainly. <laughs> and uh, I'm trying to remember, was it like a, would, didn't it look like a Pat Labor mecha or, or something? It, it, was, it was more angular than that. I think it was... Maybe more of a Gundam well, well, or no, Macross. I, it, 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 was, it was, no, because it was, it was M.D. Geist, I think. Oh that yeah, was their, that... that was their that was their flagship. That was their yeah, flagship right. show when they first got started. But like, I remember seeing occasional VHS tapes. I never really got into the habit of like trading them with people, so to speak, because I didn't have any other friends who were into it. So it was just like I would just go and and watch Saturday anime, or I would watch you know videos from the video from the video rental store that happened to be there. Um, but it sounds like you had a little bit deeper of an experience than I did. Well, I, I might have gotten started knowing what it was later than you, because I don't really think that I was aware of what it was until Sci-Fi's Saturday anime came out. And that first yeah. time that I saw the uh, Project Echo blue and gray side, that was yeah. what really kick-started me into it. Uh, so, you, you know, this... So, well, let's let's relate it to what, we, what we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get it back the, to the topic, yeah. Back in the day... Back you know, it was a thing where they would adopt these cartoons from Japan and they would they would take Speed Racer, which, you know, Speed Racer was I, w- I won't say that it was a particularly good, you know, localization, but it was a fun one. They yeah. they did what they could with it at the time. And at the same on the same token, they largely, you, you know, they kept a, the stories of what happened in each episode were probably not too much of a variation of what actually well, was going on, because, there- well. That there was were a lot of techniques that hadn't been developed yet, like the the idea of dubbing over a show and making it, you know, match, making the words match the lip movements was not the way that, I mean, animation isn't done that way in the U.S. Like, generally speaking, they get the audio first and then they animate based on the audio, frame by frame. Uh, I, I, I read a thing about that's how Charlie Brown was animated back in the day. and Yeah, they did that. I believe they did that with Scooby-Doo as well. They, they yeah, did that with a lot and, of and, shows. That, that that that's that's how my understanding is that that's how they did it in America, you know, back in the day, and it didn't that that technique didn't adapt itself well to using a, a, a cartoon that already existed and then writing the fra- writing the words because you, you can't do it backwards. It's 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 not the same process. So you know you know you you had a bunch of lip flappery, uh, you know, kung fu movie lip flappery in Speed Racer, for instance. Yeah, and but, you know, but like it makes it look a little, it makes it look freaky and and turn off to a lot of people. It also it also ended up coming with its own kind of charm, though, because Speed Racer sure, was kind sure. of famous for that uh, the, the way that everyone talked in that show. Uh, they talked at an well, accelerated I mean, rate. They made weird yes. non-human noises during their speech. <laughs> they moved. They moved very jerkily. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, there there was more of an emphasis, I guess, on you know when they when they quote unquote localized it for America, they kind of focused on just getting the show out there and kind of keeping they, they they kind of kept the spirit of the show, but they didn't really care so much about what was actually being said. They just had to try and line up mouth movements and things they were saying as best they could. Well, I mean they I wouldn't even say as best they could. I yeah, well I mean <laughs> as best as they wanted to to hurry up and get yeah, the show as out best there. As they wanted to to get it out there, yeah. Yeah. It, it's like modern content creation. I mean, and then we had, I mean, in the era, in the era that, that I started getting into anime, the, the real issue was that there wasn't a good, for some reason, and I don't understand why this was, there weren't, and there weren't a, a, a group of good voice actors that would work on anime, and I don't understand why. Maybe because they didn't like having their voices not matched to the animation perfectly. 
I don't know. I it might have been an ego thing or something. Yeah, I but. suspect that most of that was either people looking down on cartoons and saying that this isn't a serious well, thing well, as well, a serious well, no, no, cause, actor, cause or because because there were there were tons of there were tons of American cartoons, like originally American cartoons that had decent voice acting, but for some reason those voice actors never did anime stuff, or, or rarely did anime stuff. And well, I, I mean, this, why that, why that, that was more at a syndicated time, though. So that what might have been happening there was simply that these people were already working for shows, and they yeah, didn't maybe. have any reason to go and make make less money doing a dub job for a show from overseas that they probably didn't quite understand why it sure, was there. Sure. There's, but but what happened as people became more interested in these things, you know, there was a there was a steady inflow at some point of people that had. Uh, had had, se- had seen these things in Japan, and you know they would try to get copies for themselves. Yeah, it, and it, this opened up this sort of underground distribution market. I I kind of compare it to Mystery Science Theater sometimes, where yeah, yeah, it would it was a public access show that people would record and circulate the tapes, and that's what made Mystery Science Theater famous enough to get them an actual show on Comedy Central at one point these these tapes would come over from Japan and then people would share them and they'd be like, oh, that's really cool. Where did you get that? And so they, they'd, you know, they'd give everyone the hookups and this was just coming into the time when the internet was being born and people were starting to find ways to connect to people overseas. I mean, it took a while for that to happen. The early 90s, mm-hmm. you weren't getting much from Japan on the internet. Like when Windows 95 hits, you're on Netscape Navigator. At best, you're looking at other people's fan sites for things that, you know, haven't quite made it over here yet. But around yeah. 1998, it started get, getting a little bit more speed. You know, this isn't an accurate history. I'm not a historian on this stuff. But well, we, we haven't done specific research about dates and times, so we're going to be a little foggy there. But yeah, but I mean, you yeah, you I can mean, kind of if you're if you're as old as us, you can kind of remember that's like, oh, this is you know, VHS tapes were still being traded in 1998, and sure. you know, people would. I remember getting a a collection of tapes that covered the Dragon Ball Z Cell Saga, which wouldn't make it out in America. It wouldn't make it over here for, like, God, what was it, like a decade after I watched those tapes before we saw that I, saga I mean, here? Maybe a little maybe a little less than a decade, but not much. Yeah, it was, uh, it was just all this content that nobody had previously been aware of from this other country, and we ate it up. And we, as oh, soon yeah. as people started to realize that there was this market out there, you started seeing things like the... Uh, you know, there was the uh, all the early dubs for things that they tried to make popular here were suddenly coming back, and yeah. it it wasn't long before you started getting people that were making uh you know so the dub shows basically came here first. There there weren't really subtitle shows in America in the early days of right, this. Right, right. The tapes came in, and there were people that were like, "These shows are really good. Nobody's going to do a dub job for these." Let's just, you know, we don't have a studio, we don't have actors, but we have computers that can do this now. Let's subtitle these shows. And they actually had equipment that that it wasn't computers back in the day. Yeah. They they had these these pieces of recording equipment where people could insert subtitles onto the VHS tapes that they were recording. Right. But, you know, computers made that process a lot faster. And you hit this peak period in the early 2000s where these subtitle groups that had been around for years were just doing incredible things. They had people who were great at speaking Japanese, great at translating. You know, this is this all predates our ability to go onto Google and do a Google Translate to get yeah. uh, to get translations of these things. But these people were doing accurate translations. They were doing fantastic subtitle jobs, which th- this is something that's lost to time. You buy a subtitle yes, from yes. Funimation these days, and it's just the most bland. You know, here's some small print at the bottom of the screen, just enough to where you can make out what's going on and half the time I Funimation mean, doesn't so, even care to give their words a, a shadow drop or a border so that it doesn't merge with the background. These right, subtitles well, I mean, in the earlier 2000s, they were they were doing like bubble fonts for certain words and special phrases. They were putting in basically liner notes right on the screen for anything that you might not understand as a fan, yeah. which I've never been too big a fan of those, but I appreciate the effort. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, so 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 there's a, there's a techno- technological aspect here that that you haven't mentioned is that VHS was a had a limited ability to like change colors from pixel to pixel on the television. Basically, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, this was this was something I read about. What's the Animago guy? Uh, Woodhead. Wood, yeah. Or, or is Robert J. Yeah, Woodhead. Robert Robert Woodhead. And 
you know, I, I remember reading an article that I think he was being interviewed or wait, something. His, wait, and, wait, wait. Like, his name is Robert J. Woodhead, right? I didn't just Oppenheimer him out of nowhere, did I? I, I don't know what his middle initial is, so... I swear I... I, I mean, I, I know him from Wizardry. Yeah. Because he's, he's Trebroff from... Uh, from from Trevor from from Wizardry, but I, I never I never actually knew who he was until you told me that he was the Wizardry guy and the uh, and the yeah. anim- but, yeah, but, the- but 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 anyway, the the point that I'm trying to make is that VHS didn't allow you to like change colors from pixel to pixel very rapidly, and so like one of the things that they had to figure out was what color do we make the outline and what color do we make the letters themselves that they work on you know a, d- a bunch of different colors for VHS, and it turned out that like brown outlines with bright yellow internals was the was worked relatively well on everything and so like that's where that convention came from but and they still I mean, look great i don't know why people yeah. don't use the uh the brown and yellow more often but well because they just look old but i, I mean you know th- th- there's been a technological move and that technological move has made things both m- made it so that you can both make things look better and so that you can do things faster do things more clearly do things at higher resolution. Um, and, and this is one of the things that really helped anime become popular. And the, the problem, of course, is that as it became more popular, it became a larger cash cow for people. And so that's where we ended up with the problems that we have today. Kind of the precursors that people said, oh, I can, I can, th- this gets to a lot of people. I can make, you know, I can, I can do a translation job. Most people don't have the background to tell whether my translation job is correct or not. Uh, and therefore, I can insert, you know, my own per, you know, preferred cultural references into this work that has that already has an existing, you know, viewer base. And somehow these people weaseled themselves into the actual large companies that do this. And that's where we're at today. Yeah, and it's it's kind of a like down a downgrade of the culture of the times kind of thing that's going on because these are people who the uh the controversy blew up so much recently that a lot of people that worked in the industry were exposed as people who you know they they were quoted as you know having said things put things out on Twitter and and you know made things made public statements well it's, like, it's perfectly well go ahead go ahead well it, it was it was public statements that these people had made about how they you know, some of them outright said they got a kick out of changing the context of things just because they could get away with it, just because nobody yeah. was checking on them. And yeah. this led to it, to this current controversy, which is why we're bumping this episode up a bit closer. Yeah. Where a lot of anime fans who, especially old, older ones that remember what it was like in the fan sub times where, when things were really, really good. By the way, there's an extended discussion we have that that's... I guess you would call. I think we call it what the fan sub golden age or something like that. Yeah, something like That's that. Not the title, but we have a YouTube video that I'll I'll link to in the show notes. So uh, if you want to hear more about our experiences in the early days of of uh, anime, you can go check that out. Yeah. So so a handful of uh, people in the industry that it's an industry that is both gigantic but has been funneled into this little section of like a small number of people who are quote unquote the authority and the. Uh, the funnel by which anime supposedly makes it to this country. We're actually seeing a reemergence of people just pirating the things that they want because they're sick of dealing with this small crowd of people. You know, we, yeah. I remember watching a lot of older dubbed anime and I won't say that it was all great, but there was variety and the people that acted in it tried to act like the characters and somehow in the past 20 years, we have gained this small group of voice actors for anime who are, you know, they're, they're either like really famous people that did big name anime like Studio Ghibli, well, when a lot of those movies were brought over under Disney, you know, you had like yeah. Mark Hamill and people like that. And it was, it's funny because it's like, it's some of their worst work. And these are really good <laughs> actors like Patrick Stewart. Patrick Stewart, I was going to mention. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's just like, you know they can act, but you feel like they didn't take this seriously just because it was an animated movie. I mean, the the, the yeah. voice acting in the dub for Disney's release of Nausicaa is some of the driest, most monotonous <laughs> delivered lines of all time. I think it might even be worse than the small group of of anime voice actors that I am currently referring to 
who I won't name by name, but I'm sure everybody knows. Well, who's the who's we, we tried watching the the, Amer- the English dub of uh, Slayers, and it was like it was like a, it was awful. <laughs> you know, no, okay, so it was awful, but I don't. It think... was awful, but at least it was accurate. Yeah, yeah, and I don't think that so. So I will name this person. I don't think Lisa Ortiz is necessarily in the group of the people that actually hate the anime fans. <laughs> Maybe she right. is. I've never read anything about her saying that. Yeah, that's fair. I, I think that, you know, I wasn't really happy with a lot of the things that she did, but I don't think that that necessarily makes her a bad voice actor. I just no, think that no. she she didn't often fit the roles that she was put in. Uh, yeah, however, sounds... I think she tried to play the characters. Yeah. I right. think when she played, like, like I believe she played Lin Minmay, and, you know, the, the entire Robotech dub was just corny. So I can't even say that she did a bad job at that. It's actually sure, charming sure. if you go back and watch it. Yeah. And, and a lot of funny lines came out of it. I remember watching it, and we we uh, we saw that line, uh, it, it's the mayor we're saved. I want to put that <laughs> on a ringtone. I want that to be my phone when it rings. <laughs> <laughs> So so it's not like it's not like I'm coming at this like like you and I aren't coming at this like oh we hate dubs we're pro subs. I prefer subtitles because I I like a lot well, of the Japanese I, voice actors. Well so, so there there are there are dubs that are as good as or better than the original Japanese in my opinion. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like um, like, like my 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 go-to example for the dub is better than the sub is uh is Full Metal Panic Fumofu. Yeah, and that actually includes a lot of the voice actors that I have a few things to say about. Sure. I mean, Chris Patton's monotone, his deadpan, is so much better than whoever voices uh, Sosuke in Japanese. Yeah, he's like, fantastic it, it, in that role. His deadpan is perfect and, and amazing. <laughs> but, like, yeah, it's just, uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, yeah, there, can, there are good dubs and there are good subs, but, like, both of those are best when they accurately portray each other. And the problem is, the problem that a lot of people have is that they don't, they don't know... I guess we can kind of use this to segue into the next section because most people don't know enough Japanese to to kind of go tran- go retranslate something and show their work. And that's something that I think is something that we can actually say something useful about because both of us do that. And so, yeah, I don't know. That that's kind of where I'm thinking we might take this discussion in a in a moment once whenever you, you know, whenever you whenever you want. Well, okay, so I said I didn't want to name names, but I don't know. We if we're gonna if we're gonna talk about you know the 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 same group of voice actors that have been doing this forever now and it, my problem with it and I've mentioned this before possibly even on this podcast I don't remember yeah these these voice actors no matter what role they're given they I I don't know if they're just playing themselves or if they're just not trying to play the actual character and they're just going to read their lines and not care because. They never seem to play the character. Like, if you watch the subtitle and then go watch the dub, you're like, that you're out of character. You're completely out of character. You yeah. you feel like you're just... It feels like Krusty the Clown when he walked in to record his lines for the doll, except he nailed those lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he nailed all those lines before they started the recorder. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh... But but they they don't feel like they're in character a lot of times, and I yeah. think that you're losing like fifty to sixty percent of what makes a show good if if a voice actor isn't na- nailing the character or at least trying yeah. to. Because like, like I said, to. those old dubs, you know, Lisa Ortiz tried to nail the character of Lena Inverse. God bless her. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and I th- I think that it's not because they're bad at their job, because. There is a dub out there. One of the greatest dub jobs of all time was for the show Ghost Stories. It is yes. it is an ungodly boring anime if you watch the Japanese version because it was not meant to be funny. It was just here's a serious show about kids who hunt ghosts. Yeah. Oh my god, you you, you can't even and get it was, through it. It was it was it was kind of steeped in in ancient Japanese folklore and it was very dry and there wasn't a whole lot going on there. And and the humor in it was was bland, very bland. bland. All the jokes were if, if, if it was there at all. Yeah, and and so what they did is they brought it to America, and they basically remade the whole show so it was a comedy, meant for yeah. adults, with yes. these kids that are getting involved with these that are hunting these ghosts or being attacked by ghosts, and they have to figure out 
how to how to stop the ghosts, but they changed the characters. And the yes. moment they changed the characters, it seemed like the voice actors for that show were way more into it because now they were just playing a character that maybe they felt like playing. So yeah. so you know you had you had one character that was now instead of instead of just a char- the character that could sense spirits, she was a devout Christian who could sense yeah. evil and they played yeah. all the jokes on on the fact that she was she was a devout Christian. And and well-written jokes too. Very like, well-written. Of, I, um, some stuff is dated at this point, but like some stuff some stuff was deliberately dated at the time they made it as well. Like there's a Montgomery Ward joke. In there. Yeah, <laughs> like... no, no, it was a service merchandise joke. It was a service, was mer- yeah, the service merchandise oh. warranty joke. Okay. It was, I believe, it was the cat that that was like, that's about as useful as a service merchandise warranty. <laughs> yeah. And even at the time that they were recording those lines, that was already a dated joke. Yeah, well, I mean, that was the point of it. The service merchandise was gone by the time they made that well, joke. Well, no, but no, but I mean, at that point, no one even knew what service merchandise was, and so like it was like <laughs> that's that's as good as a blah 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 warranty. But it's it's people. so weird because the people that were doing that show were old enough that they probably remembered the the early days of anime, and the fact that they just they just don't care about it. It, it, yeah. I I don't understand that because I'm pretty sure most of them are, you know, quote unquote well, fans well, of anime. Well, most of the most of the people who are reading these lines are not the same people that are doing the localization, right? So so the, the beef that we have is with people mistranslating things in ways that are like self serving. This right? th- like, this is true. I I kind of got derailed, but, but it's but, important but, to point we don't out want to derail that... into that because the voice actors they, they might be doing their their best with a really bad script. But what we what we're what, from the writing perspective, what we're interested in is the the, the the act of translation and localization, and what authors should be, uh, you know, pay attention to, and what localizers should pay attention to, and like you know, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pretend there's some kind of like magic line between a translator and a localizer, whatever, right? But well, well there's a point like, to be made the, that there's no pushback. Yeah. There's no pushback from the people that are in the industry to say, hey, this. Well, uh, there's no pushback from the creators. The creators let. You know, the company take care of their work, and the company hires the lowest bidder, and the lowest bidder is some big company that has economy of scale, and so they hire pe- – they're not peopled by people that are passionate about it. They're people who are just trying to, you know, basically slam it out at the lowest possible cost as they can find, right? And, uh, you know, so they, they hire people who are willing to work for le- for very little and, and have very little supervision. There's a lot of disconnect between the different – stages of localization and and uh and and so and you know production kind of things yeah like this is the, this is the issue right like okay so so maybe we should maybe we should talk a little bit a bit a little bit about actually translating things cuz you and I have both done translations of things from japanese into english and you know we're not like you know we we do it as a hobby and we both know enough japanese that we can watch you know an anime that doesn't have subtitles doesn't have it's just in the original Japanese. We can. I can get the can gist of it t- most t- of the times. Yes, or, or or even better, right? Like like the gist of it. If if we're if we're doing poorly, and most of the time it's like, yeah, I can understand what they're saying. It depends so, on what vocabulary. It depends it is. on the anime, like fantasy right? stories yeah. are a bit harder because you don't know all the fantasy terms, sure. things like that. And then there's like there's stuff where they have like these long, you know, seven kanji names for political organizations, which whatever. But like you know, the the, the basic day to day conversation of people you can get. So here's the here's the deal, right? If I'm translating something and there's a way, well, so number one, idioms are the are are, are people use idioms as like there's some kind of like magic black box that you put in Japanese words and totally different English words come out, and that's most of the time not true. Number one, number two, there are large there there are books and books and books of professional, you know, people who study you know, the Japanese and English languages, books of how to translate idiom A in, in Japanese to idiom B in English. These these references exist. And so, like, the desire that some people have to just kind of, like, pick something off the cuff that is some weird fad expression that will be completely forgotten in six months is is one problem, right? You want your translations to have the same timeliness that the original has. So there are cases, right, where um, where the Japanese version uses slang that is not going to continue to be used in the future, right? Like Steinsgate is a really good example, right? 
in Steins Gate, there's a bunch of like weird 4chan meme speak and things like that. Or I guess it's not 4chan because it's Japan, but was 2 2 2 2 2 ch or 2 2 chan or something? I don't know. Yeah, anyway. they they call it what did they call it at channel and uh y- yeah whatever. Yeah. Uh, but but the the point is that that there there are there are ways to say like dated things in Japanese as well as there are in English, right? Like if I if I told you that something was radical. You'd ask me if I walked out of the 1990s, right? I have a book. It's called 2001 Japanese Idioms, translated yeah. into English. I've had I it for 25 years. It, it covers tons of idioms, and there's no real loss in translation in any of the, the things that had remarkable changes. Well, there, there's some loss of translation here and there. That's, well, there, there's differences fine. in terms, but the meanings of the idioms come across. Like, there's there's one It's uh uh, Jano Michi Wahebi is a yeah. snake's path is a snake, and that that pretty much is a, an exact uh, way to say it takes one to know one in Japanese. Yeah, right. But I mean, even so, there are sometimes idioms where you don't where they're not in the book, right? And so, yeah. like, but but the, but the point is, is that you know, a person who does translations and knows both languages should be able to think about the connotations of words and phrases and come up with something that means the same thing, right? Like, um, I remember there was one phrase that I translated, and, I, you know, like, I translated it as stare daggers at someone. You know, like, like person A is staring daggers at person B. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, I kind of got into an argument because it wasn't exact, but it got the, at least in my opinion, it got the, it got the same, it got the same meaning out from the Japanese, so... I think the Japanese was like literally translated. It's like a death stare or something like that. But it's not like a death because, like in English, if you say a death stare, it's like someone has died and you're looking at their eyes as they are dead. But this was like I am staring at you with murderous intent and yeah. stare daggers at is 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 what that means. But you know whatever. There are, there are cases where you have to you know think about things. But the the point is to make to 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 convey the meaning in as many of the exist in as many of the layers as you can identify, right? Like, if someone's going to say something is radical, then you need to find the Japanese word that they used for cool in 1990, you know? And then you can use that. It might involve a little research and time and reading, but that's what a good translator and a good localizer will do. What they won't do is they won't add words that don't exist or add different meanings to the idioms to, you know, grind a political axe or something like that. And that's the, that's the thing that people are getting really up in arms about right now because all of these people who have been working on this stuff for the last decade or so and they've been they've been sneaking things in and and not telling anybody and and it's only now that they're being found out because nobody is willing to sit down who knows both languages and just do the work do do you know, well not do the work but like you know how in mathematics they tell you to like show your work yeah if you're a good translator and you have your you have the original Japanese version and you have your English version. You should be able to show your work and how you got from one to the other to someone who doesn't necessarily know the language. You should you can say this word means this and this word means this and you can see these here and these three you know these three words are blah 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 and that's an idiom that kind of means this and so I use this idiom. You don't introduce concepts and words that don't exist in the original work. At least ideally you don't. And that's the problem we've got today is that people are doing that. And they've already entrenched themselves in these big companies, and so it's taken a massive amount of what would you call it, like just like investigation and exposure, investigation and exposure to actually do something with it. Because here's what I think actually happened. I I think that uh, you know the a lot of people, especially people that understand some Japanese, when they watch the uh, the dub jobs, they're just like. Uh, it just doesn't sit right with them. So, the, so most of them are probably watching either the Japanese version or the Japanese subtitled version. Yeah. And it wasn't until, I, I doubt it was until they, one of two things happened, it, as far as I could guess. The subtitles started sneaking that stuff in, which for the most part they didn't do for a long time. Well, well, for, for the most part, the subtitles have been l- relatively untouched in this, in at least the most recent scandal. Like, like yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the current scandal, for instance, to, to just give a concrete example, is that someone made a patriarchy joke in the dub of that uh, Dragon Maid show, and that's not in the that's not in the subtitles. But here's the problem: is that people are like, look at the subtitles and look at the look at the dub. 
look at the transcript of the dub, they're different. That doesn't necessarily mean that the dub is wrong. And that's the, that's the step people are missing, is that, you know, you, you should be able to, to pull that sentence out in Japanese and say, here's the sentence, here's the diagram, here's all the different words and what they mean, here is what's not in this Japanese sentence that is in this English sentence, and here's why that's a problem, right? Yeah. That's kind of where I'm yeah. standing on this, well, is that, is that, is that no one, no one's, people are, people are making the incorrect, the possibly incorrect assumption that the subtitles are right and the dub is wrong, when that might not be the case, too. Like, you need people to actually show you that the language is being butchered. Yeah, that's, that's kind of what I mean when, when I say I think this is where this is coming from. I, I believe that most people that would actually understand the Japanese were probably watching it in Japanese. And it just took, like, a handful of people that would occasionally watch the dub to be like, wait a minute, is that really what they said? And then they go yeah. back and they watch the Japanese version. It's like, that's not what they said. And, you know, the yeah. first few times, it's like, okay, whatever, something, something you know, out of whack in, in a mistakes show. Mistakes happen. And, uh, mistakes or not happen. even mistakes, just like, okay, something was, one little thing was changed, whatever. But I think it started happening so often, and people started getting like, like, like the light bulb went off on a few people's heads, and they were like, wait a minute, how pervasive is this? And it's just yeah. now, people are just now catching on to this and saying, well, wait a minute, so I'm not even getting the show that I want to see from the geniuses that are making this stuff. I'm getting, like, the second-hand, second-rate version from That's some... some jackass layered a bunch of their own fanfiction onto, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're getting the fanfic version of a beloved franchise or character yeah and this is not sitting well with people because there there's this idea of westernization where companies and people that work for these companies that acquire these licenses they they don't have a very high view of their audience so they think that their audience needs it to be westernized and no matter how many times you like explain well, this to well, people so and then well, grab well, them well, by the throat and choke them and explain it to them. Some things, there are some things that probably would be better off if westernized a little bit. Like if you're making a reference to, let's say, an ancient Japanese folk tale, you would probably want to convert it over to some kind of sim similar or equivalent, but better known in the West folk tale, right? Like, um, like, like there are cases where you want to do that a little it bit. It depends. I mean, I don't, I, I don't I think that depends. you need to do that for things like folk tales. I mean... That I, I'm I'm trying to think of a really good example because that example is one that I would specifically be like, no, you probably wouldn't want to change that because you, what is the point of changing something that could spark people's interest in being more into a property? Like you you watch a show and it references well, something I, that you don't know about. Like like okay, so put it like this. Put it like this. Yeah, yeah. It's equally possible, maybe not equally, but it's very possible that something that is westernized into a you know a folktale that more western people are familiar with the person sure. watching that show might have no interest in those folktales anyway so they're going to gloss over that they they don't they don't know what that is either they're like uh oh, whatever uh snow white briar rose i don't know who briar rose is whatever i'm just watching this show and the same thing yeah. is true when you're watching you know if they if they reference the tale of genji or well so uh, i'm thinking but, but, so so the thing is that i'm thinking kind of like about cases where the where the reference is used as kind of like a throwaway line yeah sure but but my point is that like like if, if if the point of the line is to say that some person is familiar with an old book and the contents of the book are irrelevant then you know it might it might make sense to westernize that but like it's a, it's a narrow field i'll i'll say that for sure yeah, but but the point is, if you're watching something that's from another culture, yeah, one, you should be expecting to be exposed to things that are from that culture, and uh, two, you might actually have an interest in things that you don't know about from that culture, which I think makes a good case for leaving the reference. However, I could understand so somewhat from the point of view of the person that has to bring the show over to an english speaking country say. i mean it depends on it depends on the audience right like if the audience is small children yeah then giving them an obscure japanese folktale to look up that's never been translated is probably not worth their time and it'd be funnier or if it's just the butt of a joke for instance then like just making it a joke about i don't know i don't know what kids listen to early on these days if it, you know like a sesame street joke kind of thing I don't know. There's there's places where I can see doing it, but they're very narrow in scope, and they're only when 
they're only when the cultural reference doesn't matter or or is is so flippantly used as to be basically irrelevant. Like when there's no meaning in it other than that it's standing for something else. Then you can maybe get away with it, but um, most of the time, yeah, you should just leave it as you should make leave the reference to what it is. Let's change every reference to Nobunaga to a General Lee reference. I'm sure that'll go over well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but but like putting the nitpicking aside, you okay? So I have an anecdote for this. I I, I don't remember okay, if you ahead. were there for this, but it it has to do with uh, so so you and I are fans of the Toho M1 Grand Prix. Yes, and I remember. Uh, watching it, and you know, it's 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 basically a stand-up comedy show, but it's done with the characters from the Toho franchise, right? And it, and it's done in a Japanese comedy style with you know. Well, so 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 just a quick aside, Manzai is a typical duet comedy. Basically, one person, and, and they can switch sides, but one person is the is the straight man, and one person kind of is the is the goofball, and and you can switch back and forth in 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 the thing. But basically, the these these little things are about ten minutes of stand-up comedy. That in that in that two person style, yeah. And there's, uh, I, I remember a friend of ours was saying that well, th- there's no point in watching it because it's from another culture, so you can't understand the jokes. And they specifically referenced this joke that was about a certain it, it was about a certain car from Japan. And I'm watching this, and I'm just like, you don't have to understand the history of that car model to understand the joke. All they did is make a reference to a commercial jingle in uh, for that car or or like the commercial well, for that oh, car. Okay, so 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 this is this is I think a valuable point that we can even make more concrete because they make high ace jokes in the Toho M1 Grand Prix, right? And high ace is basically a a very popular work van like a you know your standard japanese windowless work van and the joke is is that someone is using it as like a like a strangers with candy van yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that joke is very easy to translate over to english and and all you need to know is that a high ace is a, is a is a windowless work van and you're good to go <laughs> and I, I just remember our, our, our friend saying well how is anyone going to understand this that nobody knows nobody in america is going to know what what that car is and what wonderful small means and it's like it's obvious from the context that they're making a reference to a car commercial and that's not even yeah. the punchline of the joke that's just part of the joke so, so it's yeah. like there there's this there's sort of this mentality that some people get where it, where it's like it's a different culture nobody could possibly understand that and i think <laughs> i think that is where a lot of this we have to change this in these big companies come from because there's these oh, yeah. these executives in these companies are just like I, I get the feeling that they okay say- so 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 you're making a really good point here that the like yeah the, the, there's like this weird anti cultural exposure thing going on too because it's less because it's seen as less commercializable yeah and not just that but you know they sit there and they look at it and they're like I don't get it we're gonna have to change that for audiences over here <laughs> but they don't realize that the fan base here is into that that's what they're going to the Japanese stuff for and the reason that these companies are going to start losing money. I mean, they already have. Uh, Crunchyroll was bought yeah. by Funimation recently. I mean, it's they're kind of in and a down. Funimation was bought by Sony yes. or, or something like that. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> in a pretty bad downward spiral. But the, you know, the reason they're going to be losing all this money is simply because it never occurred to them that their fan base wanted the experience from that other culture. Because well, I mean, our I mean, media, there's, there's, there's a there's a corporate aspect of this where they're just where they're just you know uh, oblivious. But then there's also this kind of like malicious element where they're like, no, no, we want to we want to selectively remove the parts of these things so that people aren't exposed to these ideas that we don't like, kind of thing. Yes, the Sony element is also. I mean, the uh, malicious element is also there, definitely. <laughs> That's quite a Freudian slip. <laughs> Was it really a slip? Was it? <laughs> Was it really Freudian? <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> we all know they're not fooling anyone. <laughs> there's. There's this combination of people thinking that they're smarter than everyone else, people who who want to, you know, portray their own political message, people who are just glad to see something burn. Like I, a lot of people are making the case on the Internet right now that this is that a lot of this is political activism in the sense of we have a message and we're going to use this as our platform to put it across. I do believe there's yeah. an element of that there. I also well, believe... Well, they've admitted to it, so... <laughs> well, 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 that's the thing, though. I also believe there's a much more nefarious element of there's actually people, not necessarily the people that have admitted what it is they're doing, 
but maybe people that put them up to it. I, I think that there's just a strong anti-capitalist streak in a lot of these businesses where they're actually trying to destroy the businesses they're part of because they just want to see capitalism burn. I do not believe that Disney could possibly be doing as horribly as it's doing without someone trying to trying to bring down the <laughs> entire company. Like, like, seriously sit back and look at all the things that have gone wrong with <laughs> Disney in the past 20 years, and you tell me that there's not there's not a handful of people somewhere that's just like, yeah, let's just destroy this company. Let's bring down something that, that people love. Because nobody, yeah. even the worst of the worst commies on the planet, none of them are that incompetent. Nobody could so quickly ruin that that powerful of a business entity. <laughs> Destroy that many franchises in that short of a time. Yeah, yeah I mean, and, and all of them, and like, like no semblance of anyone trying to turn anything around. No semblance of anyone. Well, like, like they 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 they, they systematically destroyed LucasArts to the point that they got to Willow, and they're like, we have to destroy Willow too. Yeah, everything about it's it, like, they just have to destroy. And you're going to tell me that this leave is Willow alone? For God's sake, there was nothing there. And, and the funny thing about it is. Uh, especially if, 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 I I mean, you and I both kind of, uh, we, we have a bit of an economics background we hail from, but the, the funniest thing about it is that there is an element of naivety. If that's the case, if there's people that are just out there to destroy for the sake of destroying, because they don't like capitalism. Well, I mean, if that's the case, just, just think about how naive they are we're already seeing independent markets taking over these uh the slice these of pie markets. that these large corporations yeah. once had and they're just going to see these other people become these larger companies that are going to service the customers that weren't getting attention yeah and th- and then they act like they own those customers yeah yeah <laughs> well well the the, the point is that they think they're going to bring everything to the ground and destroy all the things that people love, and then people will have to love the things that they make. And they're just going to be pushed aside by the people who are actually making good stuff. Right. That's what's going to I happen. Mean, you know, There's nothing they can do about it. What's the quote? These people are nihilists. They don't believe in anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the the uh, the enemy class is not impressive. Well, that's a different quote. I'm trying. I'm trying for a big Lebowski quote, but you know, probably failing. I haven't seen that movie in a long time. Michael Malice might be small Lebowski. Sure. <laughs> but yeah, it's. I. I just. I. I really don't think that it's just. There's definitely an element of selfishness to it. I don't think that it's all sure. stupid selfishness. I think that there. Well, well, no. I mean, it's not stupid selfishness when people try to insert pro. You know pro messages of something that they're intri- that, uh, of that they're in favor of and remove messages that you know counter their pr- desired narrative that that's not that's not stupid and that's not se- that's not I, I don't even know that I'd call it selfish it's 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 you know actively destructive to culture yeah and- in the sense that it's destroying the things that were made by someone else without them knowing about it most of these japanese authors don't speak english therefore they never see what their stuff has been turned into. It's only just now that people are starting to actually like interface between these two different groups and people are like, people are pissed. Yeah. People, like, people are starting to point out to the creators that this is happening and the creators are not happy about it. Right. And that that's what we need more of is more of the creators taking an interest in how their things have been converted into other languages because, because it's their stuff. It, you know, it, it's, it, it was, the, it was the story that they wrote. And, you know, not paying attention to the stuff that you wrote just because it's in a language that you don't understand is something that has, that has, that can be solved, that has been easily solved since Fiverr became a business. (laughs) You know, uh, it's like, yeah, there's, so, so from, from the writer's perspective again, you know, I I guess I'm just going to reiterate, you know, if you, if you ever are, you know, lucky enough and, and skilled enough that your stuff becomes so popular that it gets translated into other languages, keep an eye on that stuff because don't, don't let, that stuff get out of hand and let crazy activists and nihilists destroy your reputation in a country overseas because, because they have some weird chip on their shoulder. There's no reason that you have to do that. There's no reason that you have to just let it go. Yeah. Just, uh, just pay attention to what it is you're doing. I mean, I have plans in the not necessarily near future, but I would like to translate most of my novels into Japanese. 
and I'm probably just going, I'm, I'm not even going to bother looking for a translator in America. I'm going yeah. to go right to the homeland and see if I can find someone to help me along with that. Like I might, I might do my own translation and then just pass it back and forth with them and be like, Hey, you know what works? What doesn't, I'm not a fluent speaker. So what do I need to change here? Yeah. Uh, I, I am not going to, I, I'm definitely not going to trust anyone to just like, you know, like a, tra a translation service in America it, because yeah. all it's going to do is it's going to lead me to, uh, demanding my money back the first time someone hands me something <laughs> and doesn't realize that I actually speak some Japanese and I'm just like, uh, yeah. what did you do here and why and what uh, did you do and how quickly are you going to refund me before this becomes an issue? <laughs> becomes a before before legal action is taken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I mean, I think my patience is gone. I am not playing the game where it's like, no, you fix this. I'm just not going to find someone that would do that in the first place. Right. Right. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where, you know, both both sides need to be more aware of what's going on. And, you know, you know, I keep thinking about this, but this might be a this might be a, a thing that someone could do that no one's really doing is like not just going and looking between the sub and the dub, but like actually going back to the original Japanese and and diagramming these sentences out. Now, diagramming the sentences out is a little bit too too much for what I'm thinking, but like kind of walking through the translation and explaining why these things are wrong. Because there's not a whole lot of people doing that. It's a much more, you know, skill-intensive job. But it feels like it needs to be done in some cases. Because this stuff is getting really bad. And, you know, it's it's taken us, what, five or six years to, to for, for the first Japanese author to be like, what the hell did you do to my book? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, the thing is, I, I know at some point we're planning on talking about adaptations. It, this isn't like this sure. is adaptation. Like, like if someone makes no. an adaptation of something an author's created and, you know, they call it an adaptation and you watch it and it's garbage, everyone knows that it's just an adaptation. And right. it, you, you can see that it's crap right in front of you and just like, okay, well, we, we don't let that person adapt it anymore. Now, right. invariably, especially in America... And in Hollywood, people continue to license out their products to people who have track records of not adapting things well and losing money. Right, I don't know right. why they do this. I don't know why people don't like money, <laughs> but they... it's basically a big money laundering scheme. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. They 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 they, they take equ they take the equity of say Disney Corporation and they convert it into their own paychecks, <laughs> and then the Disney Corporation <laughs> becomes a hollowed out shell. Yep, and. I, I don't know. At this point, it's just laughable to watch it all yeah, kind of burn much. down. I, I, well, I've, I've been I've been really I've been really encouraged by the fact that finally some of the Japanese community has been interfacing back and forth with the English community and like looking for this stuff and you know informing people because that, that's been something that's needed to happen for a long time and it seems like it's finally starting to happen and that might be the that might be the first domino that knocks down this whole awful facade of bad translations because they're cheap or because no one's because no one's not, not even because they're cheap just because no one's looking right the fan subgroups that did these excellent jobs did everything for free just be out of their out of the goodness of their hearts basically well i mean out of the goodness of their loving the thing that they're yeah you know, translating out of the of their and wanting to share loving it. The, and being passionate about the thing that they're translating and that that's the for the comics that i've translated that's been the reason i translated them too because i'm like this is really this is a really funny joke and I need to get this across to people who speak English because, you know, it's funny and people should read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I think that, so So here's my outlook for the future. I know that we completely failed in a lot of ways to actually revolve, bring this back around to writing. But I mean, we're talking about anime. No, and we did. That's... We're talking about translation and writing. This is this is all reasonable. I mean, it's reasonable enough. I we obviously, if we made every episode of the wordy pair just us going through like, here's how you use the English language, nobody would want to listen. Well, no, we're we're never gonna do that. Yeah. That's not yeah, that's, not, that's, that's not, not us. Fun, but well, it's not it's, it's not that it's not not us. I would love to give lectures on, but but no one wants to listen to that, and and I don't want to do it just for for no reason. Yeah, but but so let's have fun. But the the ja so okay, so there's the Japanese animation industry. Yeah. There's a lot of good and bad things going on there right now, and I think that ultimately here's what's going to happen. There are companies in Japan that have caved to this whole, oh, we need to appeal to Western audiences thing, which, you know, 
this kind of makes one wonder, what did you think you were doing when anime took off like a rocket in America to begin with? I, yeah. I think you appealed pretty well. I don't think you have to change that part of it. But but a lot of them have kind of bought into this mentality, and the ones that haven't seem to be the ones that are, you know, that they're 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 not flagging at all. Because Japan is at a point where a lot of the studios don't really you know, they're making money, but the animators don't make a lot of money for the hours they put in. A lot of the hours they're putting in are, you know, they're, they're like I mean they're like programmer the hours. Jap- the whole Japanese corporate corporate system is i mean i think sclerotic is probably yeah. the right word <laughs> <laughs> but the the thing is it's anime has turned into this thing where it used to be a bunch of people get together they work their butts off to produce a show they put the show out yeah. there but but what has happened over the years is you you have people working long hours the same hours that they worked in the 1980s higher resolutions they have to put together more detail to the things they're doing they're they're doing much fancier and better looking animation than you had to do to impress people 20 30 years ago and i yeah. i think that the burnout is is just going to cause a lot of these studios to collapse and i think what you'll see is uh especially the studios that tried to westernize they're probably going to become much smaller if not disappear and the ones that didn't are going to spread their projects out from being these you know you know you're cranking out shows like uh like like Jujutsu Kaisen has a crazy amount of good animation in it. I don't watch that no. show. I it, it's like I it's almost like it, no. it's almost like Michael Baying all of the anime. It's it's like sure the animation's great, doesn't impress me because the animation that I saw in the 80s and 90s was awesome for the time and you have yet to yeah. get back to to even that. And you know, the resolutions might be better, everything might be crisper and cleaner. But it's just it's just mindless action scenes that look that are looking good at this point, and it doesn't that doesn't matter. So I, I think well, that I people are going to matter. I, yeah, I like, think that people are going to go back. It, it's ultimately unfulfilling. Yeah, yeah. I I think people are going to go back, and they're they're going to get like they're going to do more meaningful animation. Like like the good animation in anime is going to be scenes that are actually impressive with good animation, not just flashy well, explosions. Okay, so, so let's, let, let's, let's, let's just take a two second detour. And like, I'm just going to say Porco Rosso. Yeah. That is a beautiful, beautifully animated movie that at the same time tells a very engaging story with interesting characters and, you know, comedy and conflict and all of the elements that you expect in good writing as well as good animation. And, you know, you can have one without the other, but the problem is that, if you manage, if someone manages to to do both, they're always going to end up being a breakaway hit, and everything else is going to kind of fade away in just a couple of years. Like, you know, a lot of these shows. I mean, it's even true of stuff that I've watched in the last, you know, say five to ten years. Like, how many of those shows do I still remember? Not that many. And you know, that percentage might be is that percentage decreasing or is it increasing or is it holding steady? If I had to guess, I'd say it's decreasing, right? Yeah, and like there's, the, the there's show, more I've, stuff, but le- it's less interesting or or less. It's le- it, it has less staying power. Uh, the show I've watched most in the past ten years is probably Kill Me Baby. Like rewatched it again and again, and it's easy to rewatch yeah. comedies. I know that, but at the same time, sure. it's not the best animated show. It's I mean, there's there's a lot of scenes well, where they're I not mean, even like, animated, um, but well, so 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 there, there's that. Like I, I'm thinking uh, uh, right now about uh, the original. The original Dean Studio Dean Higurashi. Yeah, like, yeah. The animation, the animation for that show is it, barely acceptable, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, and yet it's one of the best shows I've ever seen. <laughs> but the writing and the voice acting and the sound and the music and the, the the way that things are framed and the way that like the the episodes flow into one another is so amazing that you like are like I don't care if this if the animation is a little bit mad. Yeah, I don't I don't care if Higurashi is animated show. at 60 frames per second. That uh, it's not yeah. even occurring to me as I'm watching it. It Right. I mean that's that's kind of the thing. Like I've I've heard people talk about a lot of these anime movie releases lately where they're just doing incredible incredible things with the animation at high frame rates and I'm just I'm just like, yeah, but that's not that's not what made anime good. That's not what made people want to watch it over here. Most of the shows that come out now, they have these ludicrously high resolutions and animation frame rates. But then you look at the characters and you're like, Rumiko Takahashi had more variety in her faces, in her characters, 
than the characters in these shows. <laughs> like, like, like you can watch these shows and be like, these are the same five characters from that other show that's by a completely different studio, that's by a completely different yeah. art uh, writer. Like, why is everyone... How did this happen? Yeah, how, how is every... There, there's like five characters that have the exact same facial expression with the exact exact same little uh, moe accoutrements in their hair and, and, and like almost the same outfits. And you're just like... The reason I started watching anime was because it was such a different variety from what I was watching at the time in America. Yeah. Do something different. I, I don't need the 60 frames per second. Give give me a show. Give me give me something entertaining. Give me something with substance. I, so Somewhere along the line, a large group of people kind of inserted themselves into anime, and it was all about... It was basically the the uh, the video game console graphics crowd coming into anime. Yeah, just like, yeah. ooh, make it, make it pretty. Make it... Uh, the best you can. It's like okay, but make it make it look good. But let's. But because we're making it look good, we're spending too much money making it look good, and we have to spend less on on getting talented writers or or, or even talented editors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like America wasn't giving me space lesbians kidnapping princesses and being stopped by the daughter of Superman back in the eighties and nineties, and Japan was, and yeah, that's why people started watching anime from Japan because it was just just off the wall stuff that you could not even put on television in America half the time. Uh e- even the innocent stuff from Japan it was just like, "Oh, this is too adult for people." And it's just like, "No, this is this is exactly adult enough. People don't want to watch uh, not people in their people in their teens are done with muppet babies, okay?" <laughs> yeah. So so I don't know. I I don't know where this whole controversy is going to lead, but I th- I think that studios are just going to end up uh, either smaller or doing smaller projects that are. Well, I mean, you know, it's it, there's going to be so so things have been exposed. Yeah, and the fact that things have been exposed means that there's a there's an opportunity, there's an entrepreneurial opportunity for someone because some company is going to is going to look at what's happening and say, "Holy crap, we need to keep an eye on this stuff," and you know, we can't just like let this ride because we're getting we're basically getting our own reputations tarnished by the acts of people that we're just not paying attention to that we could have paid attention to but we didn't and so some company or some small group of companies is going to pick up on this and you know my hope is that they're going to tighten up their uh their production processes so that they so that they you know no longer have these unsupervised people uh making big decisions that they're not aware of the effects of, they're going to discover that they can, you know, some someone somewhere is going to make the next massive sleeper hit that is animated well, but not stunningly, but it just has an amazing story. And, you know, we're going to see that someday. And that company is going to, going to grab a bunch of market share because it deserves it. Yeah, I think the smartest thing that any Western company could do right now is, you know, Get a couple of anime fans from different genres, sit down with them, have a look at different licenses that are available. I mean, it might be hard to get some licenses just because I'm sure Funimation tries to just grab whatever they can. Yeah. But but at some point, the money runs out. And and so someone needs to be looking at, well, what can we get? Like, like I mean, Discotech Media does this. They, they basically just release yeah, a lot yeah. of old anime, and they do a good job of it. The But these companies need to just sit back and be like, let's find new shows that are coming out that we can get licenses for, that, and let's just release subtitled versions. We don't have to waste money on voice actors. Uh, I've, I've got a whole bunch of anime that came out on Blu-ray within the past decade that never had dub versions. They were, you know, just subtitled. And yeah, I'm not going to I not. A bunch of that too. I'm not going to not buy something because there's no dub on it. In fact, in a lot a lot of times, that's a selling point to me. You know, nobody ever wanted. Well, uh, th- those those DVDs and Blu Blu-rays are cheaper. <laughs> well, put it put it like this: uh, nobody cared, according to the box office. Nobody seemed to care that Godzilla was not dubbed in English. That movie did yeah. phenomenally well, and tons of people went to see it. And nobody was coming out. Which, by the way, we recorded an episode on that a f- couple of weeks ago, and it's in the queue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll bump that one up too. Yeah, but but like nobody cared. No, nobody was uh, was was saying, "Oh, well." I mean, well, if- we we can't say that nobody cared, but we can say that it did amazingly well despite what people thought was a handicap. Yeah, and I'm I'm just gonna put this out there for anyone who hasn't learned this yet: not having a dub of an anime you licensed 
Not a handicap. If it's a good anime and you're and you hired a competent translator, yeah. Well, so so I mean, I've seen mistakes in subtitles too. So like, this is not this is not all dubs. This is but mistakes you know, mistakes are one thing. Even in a dub, a mistake isn't you know it's in, it's not the end of the world. Sometimes people go off the rail over the littlest mistake. I don't have a problem with mistakes. I'm not saying about. I'm, I'm not saying that. No, but I'm just saying that like it's usually pretty obvious like, when someone starts inserting their political messages into things and. You yeah. know, a subtitle, you actually have to sit there and read it. You know, it's you're, you're thinking about it a bit more than just listening to a voice, probably. So you're probably not going to miss that. I don't think anyone will get away with that too much in subtitles. I mean, it depends, right? It depends on how... I mean, you know, the, the, the one advantage that we have is that the people inserting these additional messages don't understand how to be subtle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they're always very sledgehammery. You know, you could you could definitely insert... A, a, you know, a, 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 an incorrect narrative into subtitles, and as long as you're not using big English words that the average person can tell isn't being said in Japanese, kind of thing, you, you know, like, like, I, you know, I, I see the word anti I see the word anti disestablishmentarianism here, and I'm pretty sure that I didn't hear anyone in Japanese say anything that sounded anything like that, and you know, it's not likely. You know, I, I'm hearing the words that the Japanese. In the Japanese, in the Japanese voice acting, and they're all just like, "Hey, how are you doing?" Right? Like, I'm giving an I'm giving an absurd example, but well, here's the thing, though. What? This is post exposure. Yeah. This this kind of thing yeah. has been exposed now. It's going to be a lot harder for anyone to get away with that. So there's that's I true. Mean, there's, that, that's another good thing. Yeah. There's no point in anyone you know thinking that they're going to be able to get away with that and just it's like oh they just want subtitles well, okay we'll just do subtitles and then they try to get away with that that's almost immediately someone that speaks japanese is going to be like uh no buddy back it up a bit we're we're going to have a discussion here i mean ho- hopefully yeah hopefully I, well i mean anime fans are pretty rabid so i i think that they will yeah <laughs> well no but but there's a there's a large contingent there's a large percentage of the japanese uh, of the japanese anime fan base that doesn't know enough japanese to tell whether a sub whether there's a sub. Well, my point is that, like I said earlier, you know, someone who actually speaks Japanese is more likely to be watching either the subtitled version or even just a raw version. Yes. So they will yes. they will much more likely catch that than they would have in the dub. That's true. That's true. It, they did have a place to hide by basically making. So so this is interesting. They made they made the dubs terrible so that no one who <laughs> could read subtitles wanted to read the subtitles. And then they made the then they made the dubs. What's the word? Subversive or fan fiction? You know, they made the dubs fan fiction. Yeah, it, they made the dubs fan fiction, and you know the people who had already had enough Japanese knowledge to be like, I can deal with subtitles. We're already gone. <laughs> you, know, you know the <laughs> so funny thing about this, that is that I I yeah. don't know if Ghost Stories did well or not, but I didn't hear enough people talking about it to where I I felt like it it did well because I mean. Well, 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 so so they 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 had to license they had to do a spe- special license to do a dub that went that departed so far from the original work like that was the thing that actually happened back in the day well yeah but but like, my point is they, they had to pay extra for the license and stuff like that uh, my point but, is but that like, they didn't I mean, it, it's well known it, yeah. it's well known but like did it do well or had did dubs have such a bad because I remember when okay so this was ghost stories came out quite a while ago and I remember oh, yeah. when it uh, when it landed on Crunchyroll. People were like arguing on forums saying, no, you have to watch the dub version. There's no point in watching the subtitle version. You don't understand. And people were on there just like, I'm not watching dubs. I hate dubs. I'm only subs. And they didn't get it. So like, because they kept making dubs that nobody wanted to watch, they might've, they might've, I mean, they might've had like a, a gold mine on their hands and just, it, it just didn't happen just because people were sick of the dub jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, it, cause it was a fantastic and hilarious dub. And the fact that you had so, to, so, you, you had to convince people to watch the dub version, like, like you had to fight with them to get them to watch it before people finally yeah. came around to it. Before they realized what you were trying to say, you're like, no, no, you don't understand. The show sucks in the original <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> like it's a, it's a crappy show. It's a weekly monster movie. Sh- it's, a, it's a weekly monster fight show. And the dub takes it, in a completely different direction, while still maintaining that that bare skeleton that you know, frankly, isn't very you know interesting in the original Japanese. Yeah, and 
you know, just, just to give credit where it's due, they played it so well because they, they left everything intact. They, they left the opening theme song as it was. They didn't change anything there. And so you get through that and then you start hearing all, then, then you've got these teenagers in high school who, who are calling, who like open up the show calling each other lesbians and sluts. And you're like, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I think, I don't know. Do we have anything else to, to, to discuss on this topic? We're about at time or where we usually try to aim for time. Just that. It's good to see some comeuppance from people who don't want to do the jobs oh, that they are paid yeah, to do. Hundred percent. Because it, it's not it's not just that it's anime or anything. It's like, I have worked so many jobs in my life. Well, no, and... I mean, imagine if someone imagine if someone took Harry Potter and like translated it into Spanish and made it about you know made it about something else. You know, like if you were if you were a, a you know native Spanish speaker and you didn't speak enough English to read Harry Potter in English, you know, you'd be like. Why are they talking about potato chips? You know, I'm making an absurd example again, but that's what kind of what I do. But like, you know, I'm, I, you know, you have to put yourself in the opposite shoes uh, of someone on the other side and be like, yeah, this would have been really bad if this had happened to you know someone who actually was popular, right? And so it's it's like it's like one of those things where why is Hermione talking for a long time? Why is Hermione talking about the the horrors of the conquistadors? Like, what what is going on here? <laughs> Well, the you know the Spanish speakers they don't they don't know about the conquistadors. <laughs> they don't no 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 the Spanish speakers don't know about magic, and so we converted everything about magic to something about the conquistadors. <laughs> <laughs> and so now Harry Potter, you know, takes place in a world where uh, where, where conquistadors are are have their own special schools for their conquistadoring. Voldemort steps out dressed like Ponce de Leon. <laughs> yeah. There's like bullfights in every... <laughs> <laughs> they just replace Quidditch with bullfights. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 they like rip it straight out of Hemingway. Like none of them has ever seen a bullfight. And so they're like, I don't know, let's just get some Hemingway and throw it in there. <laughs> Oh, no, even excellent. better. It's not just Quidditch that's replaced in bull, to, bull replaced with bullfights. That's the entire premise. You're you're a matador, <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Oh, beautiful. All right. I think that works. I think let's call it an episode. Any episode we can end on bullfighting Terry, Terry, bullfighting Harry Potter is a good episode by me. I agree with you. I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, th I think we rambled a lot. We had a lot of fun talking about silly things that people do, and we get to chuckle at the inevitable comeuppance. And uh, I, when someone finally figures it out, I, I don't really have sympathy for people that weren't doing their job, losing their jobs. So have fun. Yeah, exactly. I I keep wanting to I, I keep wanting to like go to these people's Twitters and just like post links to Code Academy. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I try not to be that mean on uh, on Twitter for the most part. Yeah. Anyway. I try. <laughs> I fail. Every time. Uh, no. Alright. Celebrate this Pippi Day. Been... Everyone celebrate Pippi Day. Celebrate Pippi Day. Today January twenty seventh, Pippi Day. Official Pippi Day in America. It's already over, but celebrate it. Everywhere except everywhere except for uh, for Sweden, which I'm sure probably has its own Pippi Day. Yeah, it's uh, it's Pippi Month now. It's Pippi celebrate month. Pippi Month. What if what if we went and looked up when when Pippi Longstocking Day is in Sweden, and it turns out to be the 27th of January? Uh, like, yeah. Well, so I'm looking that up right now. <laughs> <laughs> Pippi Longstocking Holiday in Sweden. I, I'm sure that there's not more than one. Uh, it doesn't look like Who there's knows? a Pippi Longstocking holiday. Really? That's surprising. Nope. Maybe the Swedish aren't so crazy about holidays as we are. Oh, I guess uh, we, we, we've invented it. All right. Well, then it's the 27th of January. I'm sure, I'm sure I will totally we'll remember that next year. One hour and 27 minutes in. <laughs> nice. All right. Cut the feed. Cut Wordy the feed. Pear? Cut the feed, cut the feed. No, we got, we got 45 seconds. Wordy pair. Uh, episode talking about translation and, and localization and how, 
and, and from from our unique perspective. Thanks for listening. I'm Rudy. I'm Justin. And we're out. Thanks for listening to the Wordy Pair Podcast. Our passion is all things writing, world building, and getting into the weird and wonderful world of fiction. We hope you enjoyed our unique takes. If you did, make sure to like, rate, review, and subscribe to get your weekly dose of writing weirdness. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on Twitter. For Rudy, it's at Rudolph underscore Cone. And for Justin, at Ninja Mouse Chew. See you next time on the Wordy Pear Podcast.